All right. Well, welcome everyone. I hope you've had a good day, and uh, I'll pray for us, and, and we'll get started. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this, just for this season of being able to open your word and, and study it together and uh, to proclaim your praise, Lord. And, and I pray that at the end of this year, Lord, we wouldn't just believe that we've learned, but Father, I pray that by your spirit we've been transformed. And Lord, that our faith has been deepened and our knowledge of you has been enriched. Uh, but Lord, ultimately, that that, that leads to Christ-likeness in all of us. And that's truly what we desire. That's what we want. That's why we study. That's why we come. And that's why, uh, Lord, we're here tonight, Lord, for you to speak to us again and to uh, just, again, renew us day by day into the image of our Savior. We love you, Lord. We pray for your blessing over tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, tonight is, is going to look a little bit different than normal. Uh, normally we have a passage we go through, and, and obviously we finished up Ruth uh, last week, uh, which is exciting. And then tonight is really going to be, or my goal is, to do a kind of a short, uh, short presentation that actually I've already done before, uh, but to try, and, to try and basically take what we've learned, especially through Ruth, but also uh, just what we've learned through Heritage University this entire year with Romans, with Ruth, with other things, and to uh, apply it and maybe use it to illustrate some things that are helpful for us in reading the Bible as a whole. And so some of you may remember, I, I don't remember exactly when I did this, and maybe, it's, maybe I've done it multiple times, and maybe my uh, keyboard is, is not going to work. Taylor, could you go save me, please, and click on the first slide that says Christ in the Old Testament? Um, and, and Taylor will help me. So I don't have slides. Uh, I don't have slides for you, but hopefully if he does that, I'm not sure what went wrong, but there we go. Okay, so uh, just, just for the beginning of tonight, and then we're going to have hopefully at least 30 minutes, hopefully more even of Q&A of, of really just whatever you want. I've had some people ask some questions already, and, and I've got those prepared to, to try and look at. But I, I want to come back to this idea, especially... As we've looked at the book of Romans, right, one of the major emphases of the book of Romans is how Jesus was the fulfillment of God's plan and purposes all along. That God was not starting something new the day that he uh, sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit came and, and caused Mary to conceive. That this was God's plan. And even in 1 Corinthians 15, what does Paul say? He says, I pass on to you what's most important, what I received. And this, this was basically, I mean, it was in a sense a catechism. It was, here's what I am passing on to you. It is the, the sum of our doctrine that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to many, right? So we have this understanding that Christ is present in all of the Old Testament. And uh, let's see if I can flip this myself. If so, then uh, Taylor will be released to other things. All right, I got it. Uh, thank you. So Luke 24, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead. This is on the road to Emmaus. And, and I believe it was Pastor Jason who preached a message on this several weeks ago. This key verse, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So there is this sense that all of the scriptures point to Christ. That the entire Old Testament is really like you're getting on an escalator, that it's taking you somewhere. And that every step that you take, it's taking you and you are stepping closer to a destination and the destination is Jesus. And I've shared with you this, this, uh, this key principle or this key question, how do we find Jesus in the Old Testament without just totally saying, well, the, the authors didn't know what they were talking about, but maybe the Holy Spirit kind of used them robotically to write something that they didn't understand. I don't think that's right. We have to somehow understand how the Old Testament writers were still humans, were still themselves, but also how they understood the way that God was pointing them forward to what was to come. And so here's the illustration that I've used before and I've shared with you, right? When you are, when you are on a journey, and especially on a river, we're Missourians, we've done this, many of us float rivers, um, you're going on a journey. There's a current. It is taking you somewhere. Water moves in a river to a destination. It's always flowing to the ocean. 
But if you're on a river, you're going around river bends. And even though you might understand it's taking you somewhere, you might not know exactly where it's taking you or exactly what's around the next corner. And I, I think that's really helpful to understand how the Old Testament authors knew they were going somewhere. They knew that God was leading them somewhere. And they knew that ultimately that was going to be salvation through a particular person, the seed of the woman that we've, ta we've talked about in Genesis chapter 3. But as we think about this analogy, I think it's helpful because it, it recognizes the Old Testament authors understood something. And as time progressed, they understood more and more. But they didn't know everything up front, and here's what I want us to understand. That's okay. We don't have to think that Abraham knew the name of Jesus of Nazareth. We don't have to even have to think Isaiah knew the name of Jesus of Nazareth. But what we can understand is that Abraham knew that through his offspring, salvation would come. That Isaiah knew there would be a Messiah who would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He didn't know the details. He didn't know all of it. But they were looking forward to the coming of Christ. Now, as we think about the book of Ruth, just to try and situate it, and, and here's why I'm willing to go over this again, because I want us to, to see it and grow in our understanding of it. What do we know with Ruth? Ruth is an entire backstory that leads us to what? An even greater story. It's the backstory of Ruth, who's the great grandmother of King David, and we need to know the backstory that adds contours and nuance and meaning. If we understand the story of Ruth, we're going to better understand the story of David. And within the story of uh, Ruth, if we understand the story of Rahab, we're going to better understand the story of Boaz, which is going to help us better understand the story of David, which is going to help us better understand the story of Christ. Do you see how it builds upon itself? And that's what we see all throughout the Old Testament, and that's why the Old Testament still remains so important for believers, because it shows us the continuity of how God is taking us to that destination. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, they searched intently and with the greatest care. Notice the language of searched intently implies that they didn't fully understand. Right? They're trying to understand. They're trying. And what does it say? Trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit in Christ was pointing them when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. They understood that Jesus was going to suffer. They understood that it was necessary. They understood that it was part of God's plan. They didn't understand the whole picture. Jesus is the key that then helps them to understand the full picture. And then it says this, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Think about that. It, it's like even angels are impressed at how incredible the mystery and the unfolding of that mystery is in God's sight. We've talked about this in, the, in Paul, right? Paul talks about a mystery of the gospel, and in particular, he's talking about how the Gentiles would come into the faith, that that was mysterious, that the Israelites especially were not looking for that, and yet it was part of God's plan. We see this mystery unveiled in terms of Jesus being, again, the key or the fulfillment and really the key to understanding what God was doing all along, all right? Uh, but one of the ways that we can understand this is typology. And again, some of you, this might be very familiar, and you may remember even the last time we talked about it. But typology is important in that we have so many images, people, places, institutions in the Old Testament that find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. But if we are going to just define typology, it's an intentional symbolism by which an earlier event, people, office, place, etc., finds, and notice this, a greater and ultimate fulfillment in Christ. It's not just that Christ sort of kind of is a better version of it, it's that no, all of the things in the Old Testament ultimately find their telos, their fulfillment, their goal in Jesus. And whatever was true of the Old Testament shadow is now solidified in Christ. It is, is solidified in Christ to a greater degree. Just a few instances. The temple is the place where God's presence dwells. Jesus is the living presence of God. Escalation. Think of that. Escalation to a greater degree. Let's think about Ruth. Boaz. Remember we talked about these images of Boaz being the kind of man who himself had great honor but he humbled himself by serving Ruth a meal, by eating with her, by dining with her. Therefore, he elevated her status without lowering his own. Well, that is a type of Jesus. 
Jesus did what? He was the one who truly had status. He was the one who truly had honor. He humbled himself by becoming a servant. He then lifted up those who had no claim to honor themselves. He lifted us up out of our shame, and he, he he's now has even promised that he's going to serve us in heaven. So as we think about these things, we look at Boaz and we see him as a great type of Christ. And you can think about this in any number of ways. You can think about Joseph and the way that Joseph typified. This is the language sometimes scholars use, typified Christ. Uh, you can think of David. And here's the key. Not every type correlates in every exact way to Jesus. This is where we have to be careful readers. But it's pretty obvious from the Old Testament that these, that these figures are intentionally crafted to point us to a greater figure to come who is going to be the fulfillment not just of one of these things, but of all of them. So again, you think of the temple, we talked about that, Jesus is the presence of God. You think of the sacrificial system, you sacrifice things over and over again, but Jesus is, according to the book of Hebrews, the once for all sacrifice. You think of the law. The law was given to us so that we could know the ways of God and honor him. Well, Jesus perfectly fulfills the law, but by the power of the Spirit, we now have the ability not only to keep the letter of the law, but for our hearts to be transformed so that, guess what? The fruit of the Spirit is evidence in us. And, and, and notice in Galatians chapter 5 when it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all the rest. What does it say at the end of it? It says, and against such things there is no law. So you have the law of Moses, but then you have the law of Christ. So types begin and they establish an idea. Jesus expands and fulfills the idea of the type. So when we read something like Boaz, we can see him as a type of Christ. And we can do this with virtually everything in the Old Testament. That's why, by the way, the New Testament authors, especially Paul, but others too, will talk about shadows and reality. And notice, notice the, the relation, relation, that which has substance casts a shadow. It's not the other way around. It's not temple first, Jesus second. It's that temple was established as a representation of what Jesus actually is. The Bible also talks about marriage in this way. Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 5 that marriage itself is a reflection of the gospel. In other words, the gospel is first, and God designed marriage to point us back to the gospel. If we understand that, that totally changes the way that we think about our marriage. Okay? So, typology. Um, Psalm 110. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is one of the most quoted Old Testament passages in the New Testament. Where we read, and someone asked uh, last week about Melchizedek, we'll talk about this in the Q&A, but notice what it says in Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Notice who's, who's writing here. This is David who's writing a psalm that says, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah God, the Lord said to my Lord, Adonai. And Jesus uses this text when he's in the temple and in the last week of his life, he uses this text to silence all of his critics by saying what? How is it that David can call the Messiah, his son, my Lord? In their culture, a, a, a superior patriarch would never call one of his children his Lord. Again, think of Joseph. That's why in so many ways Joseph is a type of Christ. Because what happens? Jacob, the father, ends up bowing down to the son. And what Jesus notes here is David was prophesying that there would be a son of David who is greater than David. Do you see it? The Lord God said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion saying rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's do, uh, womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Okay? Um, since someone asked last week about Melchizedek, Lance asked, I'll, I'll just go ahead and spend a little bit of time here. Melchizedek shows up in scripture in Genesis chapter 14. Uh, the name Melchizedek is a combination of two words. Melek, which is king, and uh, uh, the Hebrew word that means righteousness. So you have Melek, Melchizedek king of righteousness, who happens to also be the king of what? Jerusalem, king of Salem. 
So you have this man, Melchizedek, who is both the king of righteousness as well as the king of Shalom. The sit- Jerusalem, by the way, just means city of Shalom. The name Jerusalem is two Hebrew words put together as well. City and Shalom. City of peace is what Jerusalem literally means. So Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace or the king of the city of peace, which is why he is a prime type of Christ. Just as Melchizedek is the king of righteousness, Jesus is the greater king of righteousness. Just as Melchizedek is the king of the city of peace, Jesus is the true king of the city of peace. Okay? Now, here's where people sometimes ask questions about Melchizedek. Some people will go so far as to say, well, is Melchizedek actually just an Old Testament Jesus? Like, literally, Jesus pops up in the Old Testament as this figure. And here's the reason why I think that's not true. Melchizedek shows up in the New Testament, not only quoted in Psalm 110, but also in Hebrews chapter 7. Where it talks about how Melchizedek has no beginning or end of days, no parents, no genealogy, which is why some people say, well, it's got to be Jesus. Here's what I think is going on in in Hebrews chapter 7. I think the author of Hebrews is noting that within the book of Genesis, there is no record of Melchizedek's genealogy. You say, okay, well, so what? In the book of Genesis, genealogy is a big deal. You follow all the way from Adam, down from Adam. And we're, by the way, talking about this in the way right now. As we follow the genealogies in Genesis, the genealogies tell us where the focal point of the story is. You start with Adam. Adam, of course, had Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain kills Abel, so they start a new line. You have in Genesis chapter 5 the family histories of uh, Seth. And then from Seth all the way down to the genealogy to Noah. Then from Noah, you have Shem, Ham, and Jepheth, but the line continues especially through Shem. Through Shem eventually comes Abram, who becomes Abraham. Then from Abraham, you have Isaac and Jacob, right? So you have this genealogical track in Genesis that's telling us, these are the people who are really important. These are the people we're focusing our attention on. These are the people who are going to be the instruments that God uses to bring about salvation for the whole world. All the way from Adam, by the end of the story, you get to the sons of Jacob. But Melchizedek pops out of nowhere, seemingly in the book of Genesis. The author of Hebrews picks up on that. I don't think literally because he didn't have father or mother or literally because he didn't have an ending of days or a beginning of days. It's just in the book of Genesis. He's in, he's out, he's a priest of God most high, and that's basically all we know about him. But, did you hear me say, he is a king who is also a priest. And that's why, especially for the book of Hebrews... You have Jesus who is what? A king who is also a priest. Hebrews quotes Psalm 110, you are a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Why is that important? Especially in the theology of Hebrews, it's important because the Levites were the priests, not the people from Judah. But the author of Hebrews says, but there's a greater prior priesthood that Melchizedek represents. And Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And by the way, timing is important. Melchizedek comes well before the Levite, the Levitical priesthood was ever established, which is why the book of Hebrews says what? This is kind of funny, you know, for our culture. But he says that actually, whenever Abraham bowed down to Melchizedek, Levi was in Abraham's loins, which meant what? That the Levitical priests through Abraham bowed down to Melchizedek. In other words, Melchizedek is the greater priesthood, and Jesus is the greater Melchizedek, okay? Um, Let's keep going. Okay, Uh, the tabernacle. Again, I I won't take the time to go through all these because I want to just have some good discussion time, but the tabernacle. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there were already priests who offered the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve as a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Copy and shadow implies what? Original and substance. You have to have an original to make a copy. You have to have something that is solid and substantive to cast a shadow. But where we sometimes fall is we forget that Jesus is the original. Jesus is the, is, the, uh, is the substance that casts the shadow on the other things. This is silly, but for those who are Star Wars fans, it might help. 
the Bible is not chronological in the sense of, of a Jesus, Jesus was prior, but he doesn't come first in the scriptures. And those who are Star Wars fans know where I'm going with that. How does Star Wars, this is how you know if someone actually understands Star Wars or not. When you say, what's your favorite Star Wars movie? And they say, oh, it's episode one, A New Hope. No, you don't get it. Like right there, you just showed your hand. Episode one is not A New Hope. Episode four is A New Hope. It's the first episode that came out. Well, in a sense, and, and, and by the way, that was genius, right? Because then you have, I'm not going to get into Star Wars, but if you know it, like you know, it's, it's genius. Where did, how, did, how, how did this happen in Star Wars? And in a sense, the Bible does the same thing. I'm going to give you the copies in the shadows, and then I'm going to wait to tell you the full story, because in doing so, I'm going to show the fullness of my glory. Why, and, and, and we can ask many questions about why God does it that way. Well, in a sense, allowing all those things to happen prepared us to understand the fullness and the depth of God's love in coming in his own flesh to pay the price for our sins. In other words, if God would have just said, well, Adam and Eve sinned, and I'm going to come in human flesh, and I'm going to come take care of it, how, how would we have appreciated that? We wouldn't have appreciated that at all. We wouldn't have even begun to understand the meaning of that sacrifice. And so we have to understand there is substance, there is an original that casts a shadow in a copy. Important to understand this is, again, the idea that, that the progression of revelation teaches us to look forward, always forward looking. And this is, if you think about the Old Testament, the Old Testament always is leaning forward, not backward. It's always pushing us to the future, not to the past. Think of this. You have the triumphant sea, Genesis 3.15. You have the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12. What's the Abrahamic covenant say? Through you, Abram, and through your seed, all nations will be blessed. You have the Lion of Judah in Genesis 49, 9 and 10. You have the Star from Jacob, Numbers 14. You have the Prophet from God that in Deuteronomy 18, Deuteronomy 34. What is that? That's the text that says, one day there will be a prophet like Moses who will teach the Word of God. And then, of course, when Jesus comes in the New Testament, what does he do? He goes and preaches the Sermon on the Mount. But rather than saying, thus said Moses, he says what? Thus say me. Not says, he does, Jesus never says, thus says the Lord, because that would be superfluous, right? No, he just says, I tell you, there's going to be a prophet of God. There's going to be a son of David, 2 Samuel 7. There's going to be a suffering servant. So you see the progression. You see how the Old Testament builds upon itself, and it points us forward. It drives us forward to the one who is to come. By the way, the Old Testament ends. Like if you read the last chapter in the Old Testament, someone's going to come. Who's going to establish? He's going to, he's going to bring peace. He's going to bring people back together. The, the end of the Old Testament is a giant ellipsis. Dot, dot, dot. What's to come? The Old Testament by itself is not complete. The New Testament shows us the rest of the story. Again, we're flying through this. We have other pictures. We have the Son of Man, Daniel chapter 7. This is a prophecy uh, of, of God. He gives it to Daniel. What does Daniel 7 say? I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. What was one of Jesus' most, uh, what was one of his favorite designations of himself? Son of man. Think of this. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost, right? The son of man has authority over the Sabbath, so that you may know the son of man has authority to forgive sins. I say to you, take up your mat and walk. Son of man, son of man, son of man came with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Ancient of Days, obviously God the Father, God enthroned, okay? Also similar with Revelation 4 and 5. And to him, to the son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Fascinating, right? That in the book of Daniel, you have God ruling and reigning over all creation. But you have one who's like a son of man. He's a son of man, but he's more than a son of man. Who is what? Ruling over all under God. So you have this picture, right? You have this sense that a man is going to come who's more than a man. A son is going to come who's more than a son. And he's going to rule and he's going to reign over all nations. And this is why, by the way, 
whenever Paul looked back at the Old Testament, whenever the gospel writers looked back at the Old Testament, whenever the early Christians looked back at the Old Testament, they said, it's not enough just to have a human Messiah. You can't just have another David, because guess what David wasn't? One who ruled and reigned from heaven. David had a cool throne. David had a good run. David had some major mistakes. But David was not this son of man. This son of man seems to be, even in the Old Testament, a picture of a divine son who is going to rule over God's creation as one who has the right to rule as well as the power. You see it in the Old Testament. Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. Raises the question, anointed by what? You remember David is anointed by oil. Samuel comes and anoints him. But oil is a picture of what? The Holy Spirit. This is why, by the way, when Jesus was conceived, he was conceived through the Holy Spirit. Whenever Jesus goes to his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes upon him, anointing him. He is the Messiah, the anointed one. The Greek word, I've said this many times and many of you know it, but just as a reminder, the Greek word for that's the Hebrew equivalent of Messiah is Christos. So when we say Jesus Christ, we are literally saying Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. Jesus Christ is not a name. It's not Jesus' first name, Christ's last name. It's Jesus the Messiah. It's a title. And this Messiah is the one who's going to come and he's going to establish the kingdom of God on earth. This is why in Acts 1.6, even after Jesus has risen from the dead, his disciples still don't quite understand it. And they ask him, right, right before he's about to ascend to heaven, they say, is now going to be the time that you establish your kingdom on earth? And, and, and if you understand the book of Acts, you understand that that question is ironic. Why? Because Jesus is about to tell him, guys, 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 it's not just about Jerusalem anymore. It's not just about this kingdom. You are going to be my ambassadors in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth because we're taking this message on the road. And the rest of the book of Acts is what? The spreading there's the, there's the if, if you think of it as a pool, right, the concentric circles, there's this stone that's dropped on the day of the resurrection, the event of the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, the events of Jesus' life start a movement that's going to continue to sweep through. But to understand that, we have to understand Jesus is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, prophesied in Isaiah 42. This is one of my favorite texts. Why? Because it talks about, think Romans, right? Think of all the things we talked about. Look here, um, look here. Uh, starting in, in like the middle, I don't have the verses labeled, so I don't know which verse. The coasts and islands will wait for his instruction. This is what, uh, this is what God, the Lord says, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I'm the Lord. I've called you for a righteous purpose. I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you. I'll appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes, to bring prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. Do you hear uh, Luke chapter 4, the sermon uh, at, at Nazareth? Jesus here is picking up on this language of Isaiah. Starting up top, I'll put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. Okay? Isaiah 49, Jew and Gentile, again think Romans, and now says the Lord who formed me in the womb to, his servant, to be a servant to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to myself. Hear it, Jacob and Israel, that's first, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, Romans 1. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile, the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Over and over in Romans, Paul's following Isaiah. Jacob and Israel first, for I'm honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. But he says, God says, look at verse 6. It is too small a thing for you to bring my servant, or to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I've kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. As Paul was writing Romans, he was looking to Isaiah and the prophecies of the Messiah to come, who would bring together the kingdoms of the earth. By the way, in the book of Acts, I think this is significant. In the book of Acts, you start where? Jerusalem with the Judeans, right? You, you start with the southern kingdom, but then you go to the Samaritans, who what? Represented the northern kingdom, the Israelites, the tribes of Jacob, and then the fullness of the tribes of Israel, and then eventually you get to the ends of the earth. So it's in order on purpose. 
Isaiah 52, we're working up to Isaiah 53. My servant will be successful. He'll be raised and lifted and highly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured. This is the Messiah. His appearance was so disfigured, he didn't even look like a man. And his form did not resemble a human being. And he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him. For they have, will see what had not been told them, and they will understand what they had not heard. Mystery to be revealed. Isaiah 53, we know this. Yet he himself bore our transgressions. He carried our pains. We in turn regarded him struck and, er, stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and were healed by his wounds. Going down all the way through him being silent. Uh, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. This is the Great Commission. Go into all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, I'm not even going to talk about this, but there are those who argue, I, I guess I am, just for a second, um, that, that, that Jesus literally appeared in the Old Testament in different ways, whether through the angel of the Lord or in other, other ways, fourth man in the fire, things like that. I think that's very possible, very interesting, uh, but it's not the focus of the night. Um, Again, the blessing that God gave to Abraham, through you and your offspring, all nations will be blessed. Look at verse 18. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. It was always about pushing forward so that Christ would be glorified as the king of the nations, the king over all kings, the Lord over all lords. The Old Testament keeps pushing us forward. All right? So I just, I just, I, I think it's good and, and helpful to just be reminded, especially as we think about the Old Testament, or even if we want to understand Romans, I, I, I don't think it's possible to overstate how much Paul knew that for Jesus to truly be legitimate, it had to be an outflow and birth from the Hebrew Scriptures, which is why he looked to them to show who Jesus was. It's also why Paul said to Timothy, what? You have known the Holy Scriptures from infancy, and you know that they have made you wise unto salvation. And, he, and please hear me. He was not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was talking about the Old Testament. That they would make you wise unto salvation because they predicted the coming of Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the story. And, and, and here's the cool thing, and then we'll do Q&A. The more you study the Bible, the more you get to see sort of the comprehensive beauty of it right? And, and, and it's kind of just as a favorite example. It's kind of like your favorite book or your favorite movie. The more you read it, the more you'll enjoy it. The more you'll notice, the more you'll appreciate it. And the fact that you know the ending doesn't change the effect that the story itself has on you. The same thing. And it's also, by the way, and give uh, Dave Quackenboss, who was here while we were in Israel, give him credit for this. The more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. Which is, which is one of the humbling gifts of the scriptures. And, uh, and yet we need to come and we need to recognize any time we read, whether it's Romans, whether it's Ruth, or whatever it is that we do, it should help us to understand the whole better. And then as we understand the whole, we're going to be able to understand the individual parts better. And then, guess what? As we understand the individual parts better, we're going to be under able to understand the whole better. And the cycle begins again. This is what makes Bible study a lifelong endeavor is that the more we study, the more we learn, the more we see, the more we study, the more we learn, the more we see, and it continues. But where does it take us to? It always takes us to Jesus. Jesus is the center of it all, okay? All right, so we've got about 25 minutes of just whatever you want to talk about. This is the last day of Heritage University. Anything in Ruth, anything in Romans, anything else, as long as you're not trying to trip me up, I don't care. I'll do the best I can. Okay. Okay. So, so baptism. Uh, When we look at the book of Acts, there are those who argue that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second experience subsequent to salvation. So you're saved, but then later there is a baptism of fire, baptism of the Holy Spirit, that God will give to some but not to all. 
there's variations of this. Some would say if you don't receive a, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're not truly saved. Some will say the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues and that that is the definitive evidence. I think those are all wrong. And, uh, and so let's just talk about how baptism functions in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, uh, you have the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes with tongues of fire on the people at Pentecost, and they speak in tongues. What is speaking in tongues? It's speaking in their own language, but other people being able to discern what is being spoken. Now, just a footnote to that, it's not clear that that's always what speaking in tongues is. 1 Corinthians 14, that doesn't really seem to make full sense of it if that's what's going on. But at least in Acts chapter 2, we know definitively that's what's going on in Acts 2. People speak, other people hear it in their language. In that sense, the Acts 2 miracle is not a miracle of speech, it's a miracle of hearing. Okay? So some people say Acts chapter 2 is the model. But here's the problem with that. Um, if you look at the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit falls on people in different ways depending on the context. So Acts chapter 8, Philip goes to Samaria. He preaches in Samaria. The Holy Spirit doesn't fall until Peter and John come to Samaria and they lay their hands on the Samaritans. So these people express faith in Christ. So they profess faith, what I believe is a true salvation moment. But the Holy Spirit doesn't fall on them until later. And the question is why? And I think the answer is clear. Because the, the people in Jerusalem, represented by Peter and John, in other words, the Jewish people, they hated the Samaritans. So if they would have heard by word of mouth, oh, the Samaritans got saved and the Holy Spirit fall, fell on them, they would have been like, Psh, yeah, right. They needed to be there to see it. And, like I said earlier, who were the Samaritans? The Samaritans, and this is where, right, that loop helps us understand, the Samaritans represented the northern tribes of Israel, the ten northern tribes that went astray first. You remember the Old Testament story? You have twelve tribes split into two kingdoms, ten tribes in the north, two tribes in the south. You have the people of Judah, who are the true, you know, and, and who is it? It's the tribe of Benjamin, it's the tribe of Judah who stay true. This is why Paul, by the way, could brag about being a Benjamite. I was faithful, I was true, I was a part of the true Davidic kingdom. But Samaria represents the breaking of the kingdom. You have then, and, and think about, think about how beautiful this is. That literally through the laying on of hands, through a physical touch, you have the restoration of the kingdom of Israel in Acts chapter 8. But here's the key. The disciples have to be there because they have to understand this is real. And the physical touching of the people represents a true coming together, which is why I think it's appropriate for that context. It's different. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls. Acts chapter 8, it's through the laying on of hands. Okay? Acts chapter 10, it's different still. And again, if you understand Acts, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. That's the blueprint. Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2, Judea, Samaria, Acts chapter 8. The ends of the earth begins in Acts 10 where you have Cornelius. And Cornelius and his family, just to, to kind of summarize it, they receive the Holy Spirit not through the laying on of hands, but they receive it the moment they profess faith in Christ. The evidence in Acts 10 is, is speaking in tongues, but they receive the Holy Spirit. Then they say, who can prevent us from being baptized? In other words, salvation and baptism, different experiences, different moments. Very clearly. Salvation does not occur at baptism. It occurs the moment the Holy Spirit comes on them. Otherwise, you have to say, well, they have the Holy Spirit, but they're not saved. Well, that's, that's not true. It's impossible. And so you, and, and by the way, Acts chapter 10, Peter's there at Cornelius' house. He's preaching, but he doesn't lay hands on him. Why? Because uh, here's, here's what I believe to be true. God wanted us to know it's not magical laying on of hands. It's not because Peter has power. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 12? The Holy Spirit gives gifts to whom he wills. We can't control the Holy Spirit. But here's, so that's what I would say about Acts chapter 2 or 8 or 10 being, being the model, the problem is they're all three different. At which point, none of them can be the model. But what do we see? We see in the scripture that there's a very clear difference between baptism and salvation. Just a couple of examples. The thief on the cross, never baptized, obviously saved. Today, you will be with me in paradise, Jesus said to the thief on the cross. Never baptized, but truly saved. Unless Jesus is a liar, which he's not. Okay. Um, Peter talks about this. He says, baptism, and this is what some people use to, to argue for, for 
baptism and salvation. Peter says, baptism which saves you. But then Peter says, not the washing away of dirt with water, but the true confession of your heart. So here's how I see it. To simplify it, here's how I, I, I see it. Physical baptism is a symbol of what the Holy Spirit does the moment we're saved. The Holy Spirit, the moment we're saved, enters us. The Holy Spirit baptizes us. Or we could say we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Same thing. I believe that happens the moment of salvation. Why? Because, because think of this. Think of how that dovetails with the image of new birth. You're born again. Born of what? According to Jesus in John 3, you're born of the Spirit. So you're born once of flesh. You're born once of spirit. Born by the Spirit. The Spirit of God enters into you. The Spirit of God baptizes you. And then your earthly, physical baptism is a symbol of what has already happened to you. Namely, that the Holy Spirit has already baptized you and made you part of the family of God. So, therefore, if the Holy Spirit has already made you part of the body of God, the body of Christ, then physical baptism, as important as it is, is a symbol, is an act of obedience, is an act of, of publicly proclaiming, it can't be salvific or it, can't, it cannot save you if you have already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, and, and this is, again, just a, like postage stamp. True baptism is baptism of the Holy Spirit. Physical baptism is a representation of what the Holy Spirit has already done. Okay, good question. Yeah, Lance. Yeah, yeah, Jubilees. Uh, it's awesome. So, uh, you read... Um, in the Levitical system, there is a there is a uh, an entire system of Sabbaths that Jubilees is a part of. So Jubilees, to answer Lance's question, is basically every fiftieth year. There's seven patterns of seven. Every seventh year, uh, well, hold on. Let me explain like this. Every seventh year in Israel, there was a Sabbath year, and on that Sabbath year, you were to let your fields lie fallow. So this was this was part of pro crop preservation. This was part of making sure that the, the promised land, right? The land is very important. The fields are very important. On the seventh year, you would not sow crops, which would then allow the soil to rest, which would then allow it to be renourished, which would then allow you to then go back to your normal schedule, schedule on a seven-year basis. So there is a Sabbath year every seventh year. But on the seventh seventh, okay, so every 49 years or 50, right, if you're rounding up, on the seventh seventh, you have the year of Jubilees, which is the Sabbath of Sabbaths. By the way, the, the pattern of seven obviously goes all the way back, what, to Genesis 1, where God creates in six days, and on the seventh day he rests. So basically you follow that pattern with years, the seventh year you rest, and you follow that pattern, seven sevens, the year of Jubilee. Now here's what's interesting. It's all tied to the land, because the land belongs to certain tribes and certain clans. So in, in Israel... Whoever owned a piece of land, if you sold it on the year of Jubilee, you would receive back the deed to your land. It, it was like if you owned it initially, you were going to get that land back. And so the entire system of Jubilee was a giant reset button. By the way, it wasn't just your land. You would get your land back. Any debts that you have would be automatically canceled, done with, done away. I owe you a million dollars. Not this year. Jubilee, zero. And literally, all debts would be paid, all slaves would be released. Also important to understand how different the Old Testament slavery system was than, uh, than other forms of slavery. Um, debts would be paid, slaves released, land would go back to its owners. That was the Jubilee system. Now, here's the question. Uh, how did that actually work in practice? Unfortunately, there's no evidence the Israelites ever actually did it. But the stipulations literally say... Okay, you can't, because we all know supply and demand, invisible hand, right, all these things with economics. Well, if Jubilee is in five years and I know you're getting your land back, I'm not buying your land. Or I'm going to extort the price. I'm going to change the price. And what the way it works is they would base the price based upon how far it was from Jubilee. Um, but then, uh, essentially, essentially, there's no evidence they ever actually did it. But it was a very important symbol, and it was also a reminder that, that God was the one from whom all forgiveness came. And therefore, humans were supposed to, especially Israelites, right? 
in relation to each other as God's chosen people, we're supposed to reflect the forgiveness of God. Here's where that's important in the New Testament. We talked about Luke chapter 4 earlier. Luke chapter 4, Jesus is at Nazareth preaching his first sermon, and he says what? This, today, this text has been fulfilled in your hearing. I have come to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom to the captives, and he references Jubilee. He references the year of Jubilee when he says uh, to basically, I've come to pay all the debts and to set everyone free. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is my ministry is the ultimate Jubilee because I have come to proclaim total and complete and permanent forgiveness of sins. Jesus, the, he, he, here's what he says. He says, it's the year of the Lord's favor. That's what Jubilee is. Why did Jubilee exist? It, it existed to make sure that no Israelite would ever be extorted or um, robbed permanently from the possessions that, think of this, God had given them, and therefore everyone else was to respect. So that's basically uh, the system of Jubilee in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good question. If you didn't hear his question, he said, do you think there are any limits to types? And yeah, I, I do think there are limits. I, I am very comfortable using as a type anything that the New Testament uses as a type. So 1 Corinthians 10, Jesus is the rock in the wilderness. Okay, that's kind of weird. You don't really read that in the book of Numbers, but Paul says it. So, hey, who am I to disagree? You know, um, and, and by the way, what would be the type? What happened, remember that, that in, in uh, the book of Numbers, Moses strikes the rock and the, right, the rock brings forth water that then enables the Israelites to survive in the wilderness. Okay, So we understand how that type would point forward to Christ. Christ is struck from his body, blood and water flow that leads to life for us in sin. Okay, So there's the type, there's the correlation. But can we make everything, let's just throw just a, uh, I mean, a silly example, Balaam's donkey. Well, is that a type of Christ? I don't think so. It's just a talking donkey. It's cool, okay, but it doesn't have to be a type of Christ to be what it is, right? Um, or whatever. You know, you could think of anything that you wanted to and say, well, the donkey, you know, spoke the words of God and he saved the man from his own destruction. The donkey is a type of Christ. The donkey's a donkey, okay? It doesn't have to be that to point us to Christ. And so, um, yeah, that would be my best answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dylan. Yeah. Did Taylor put you up to this? Did he? Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Un so actually, it's funny that you asked that because if, as I use the example of Balaam's donkey, it's actually more complicated than that because Balaam's donkey sees the angel of the Lord in the way of Balaam. So it's funny that you asked that because some people believe Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Uh, I'll try and do a postage stamp explanation of that. We, we use the word angel, we immediately think created being who is a servant of God. But the word angel does not necessarily mean that. It's just a word that means messenger. So if we read angel of the Lord as messenger of the Lord, all of a sudden that makes us ask the question, well, what does it mean to be a messenger of the Lord? Is it possible that Jesus, the divine logos, right, the second person of the Trinity, could have taken on some kind of visible shape as a messenger from God? Some people say yes. A lot of different reasons for that. It's because of what the angel of the Lord does in the Old Testament. What does the angel of the Lord do? Many things that it seems like only God himself can do. He forgives sins. Uh, you see that. Um, oh, hold on one second. I'll come back to that when it comes back to my mind. Genesis 22, the angel of the Lord speaks from heaven and he says to Abraham, don't slay Isaac. Okay. And when the angel of the Lord speaks, it says the angel of the Lord appeared, and then it says Yahweh said. Well, which is it? 
the angel of the Lord appeared and Yahweh said? The answer is maybe it's both. Maybe the messenger of God appeared and the messenger of God was Jesus, therefore Yahweh said. Same thing in, in Exodus 3 and 4. It says that the angel of the Lord appeared in the burning bush and then God spoke to Moses. Well, which is it? Is it the angel of the Lord speaking to Moses or is it God speaking to Moses? The angel of the Lord speaks in the first person for Yahweh. So instead of saying God says, the angel, the angel of Yahweh never says thus says the Lord. He always say, I say, I say. Um, so you have that in Exodus chapter 3 and 4. You have the angel of the Lord in, in Exodus 3 and 4 saying, take your sandals off because the place where you're standing is holy ground. Well, if this is a servant, if this is an angel, why do I have to take my feet off or my sandals off if this is holy ground? So the angel of the Lord makes the ground holy. The angel of the Lord speaks for Yahweh in the first person. The angel of the Lord um, also, by the way, very possibly could be the same figure who is the commander of the Lord's armies. And, and why do I say this? You have Exodus 3 and 4, angel of the Lord speaks from the burning bush. You have Joshua 5 and 6 where it says Joshua is about to go to Jericho. Fascinating verse, chapter, whole thing. The commander of the armies of the Lord, Joshua is going, kind of scoping out Jericho. The commander of the armies of the Lord comes up. Joshua recognizes he's a warrior. He's got a sword. He's, he's big, bad, and he's much better than Joshua, who himself is a bad guy, right? And, and what does he say? He says, are you for us or are you against us? And what does the commander of the armies of the Lord say? He says, neither. Interesting. Because some say, this is, this is maybe a little bit more in the weeds, but some say the angel of the Lord is essentially Israel's guardian national angel. But if the angel of the Lord is the same figure as the commander of the armies of the Lord, you say, well, is it the same figure? Maybe. Here's why. Because what, the, what does the commanders of the armies of the Lord say to Joshua? He says the same thing. The angel of the Lord said in Exodus 3 and 4, Take your sandals off because the place you're standing is holy ground. Says the exact same thing. And by the way, you say, well, it's a different title. Maybe not. Why? Because in Joshua, or in, in Joshua 5 and 6, the commander of the armies of the Lord self-identifies rather than being described by someone else. In other words, Exodus 3 and 4, now it's getting too complicated. I think I'm losing you, but here's the point. Um, Exodus 3 and 4 Moses describes him as the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord doesn't say that of himself. Joshua 5, of himself, this being says, I'm the commander of the Lord's armies. Well, if he's the commander of the Lord's armies, when we get to the book of Revelation, who's the commander of the Lord's armies? The one riding on the white horse, the one who's faithful and true. You see these parallels. Forgiveness of sins, accepting of sacrifices, um, various other things that it seems like only God can do. Okay, um, so the question is, well, is, isn't that a slam dunk? Well, then it's obviously God. Well, maybe not. Why? Because uh, whenever kings would send emissaries, those emissaries would often act as truly as if they were kings themselves. Okay, this is why in the Gospels, by the way, even in two of the Gospels, I can't remember the references, so you'll have to just look them up. One of them says that the commander came and asked Jesus. Another says that the commander sent a servant to ask Jesus. You say, which is it? Both. The servant coming is the commander coming in an ancient Near Eastern mindset. So to have a messenger does not necessarily mean that the presence of the person who sent him is absent. In fact, the whole purpose is that messenger represents the presence. So there are a lot of Christians who would say, yes, the angel of the Lord is Jesus. There are a lot who would say, no, I won't even get into the reasons why no. Um, except that the New Testament never says it. But here's what's interesting. The New Testament never mentions the angel of the Lord. Why? Well, if you believe it's Jesus, it's because there is no angel of the Lord anymore that comes and visits. It's Jesus, which is why the New Testament never mentions him. That's an argument from silence. Well, arguments from silence are only as powerful as the silence that they should explain. Uh, so anyway, so it's, it's kind of a big deal. I mean, it's a big debate, but... I go back and forth, man. I really do. Like now I'm like, yeah, I think it's Jesus. And then in 10 minutes I'm going to be like, no. Here's why no. I'll tell you why no. <laughs> same thing. He says, Jacob, interesting, is it the same being? Big debate, right? J who wrestles with Jacob? Genesis, I think, 32. Who wrestles with Jacob? Jacob wrestles with this being, obviously physical. And what does Jacob say? I've seen the face of God. He names it Penuel. I have seen the face of God and yet I've lived. Okay, um, it's never described as the angel of the Lord in that passage, but 
you have this interesting, and here's, here's where the, all of these literary connections, right? You're piecing them together. Exodus 3 and 4, Judges 5 and 6. Genesis 32, Jacob asks him, what is your name? And what does he say? I'm not telling you my name. You couldn't understand it. The angel of the Lord shows up and judges, I don't know, somewhere in Judges, maybe like chapter 12 or something, where you have the birth of, b- the birth of Samson and the angel of the Lord. Fascinating passage. The angel of the Lord shows up first to Manoah's wife, who's Samson's mother. She's never named. But then he shows up to Manoah, who says to the angel, who, that it explicitly says, the angel of the Lord, who says to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? And how does the angel of the Lord respond? He says, my name is too wonderful for you to understand. So the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is never named. In fact, when he's asked his name, he says, you couldn't understand if I told you. Which is why many people think it can't be Michael. Because Michael has a name. It can't be Gabriel. Because Gabriel has a name. Who's the only one who has a name that would be unknowable to people in the Old Testament? Well, the name above all names, right? Also, in that same passage, the angel of the Lord accepts a sacrifice. Manoah offers a sacrifice. The angel of the Lord consumes the sacrifice and goes back up to heaven. Also, what happens? The angel of the Lord accepts worship. Manoah worships him and offers a sacrifice. Well, what does the angel say in the book of Revelation when John bows down to worship that angel? He says, no, 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 no. Don't bow down and worship me. I'm just an angel. I'm just one of you all, right? So that's another reason why people say it accepts worship. Uh, that it's Jesus. Um, anyway, so <laughs> you're convinced. Here's, here's why I know, though. Here's why I know, and this is a big deal. Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 6, Stephen's sermon explicitly talks about the angel of the Lord. And he, he refers to him. He's not there, but he refers to him. And guess what Stephen does not say? He doesn't say the angel of the Lord is Jesus. So it's like you have, you have him mentioned in the New Testament without him being identified. That could be explained. Is Stephen going to stop and say in the middle of this sermon to the Sanhedrin, oh, by the way, the angel of the Lord Jesus? No. But, uh, yeah, anyway, okay. It's a, it's a fascinating thing. It really is. We have time for maybe one or two more questions if I don't <laughs> talk for ten minutes. Yeah, Lance. Interesting, some people think that's an angel. Why? Because that same young man, the only the only feasible answer, if you didn't hear Lance, there's a naked young man at the end of the book of uh, in, at the end of Mark 14. Young man loses his cloth, runs away naked. Why is that there? Because there's also a young man who comes to the tomb, I think in Mark 16, that seems to be the same person. And what do the other Gospels tell us? That there were angels, right, who were at the tomb. So is it possible that there were angels who were looking like humans even when at the crucifixion? Maybe. You know, I mean, uh, when Jesus says, literally, I could call legions of angels, we know that angels showed up uh, in various places, guised as humans. So, yeah, but there's a connection. By, by the time you get to the book of Mark, there is a young man who is at the tomb. And most people, most scholars, I think, basically try to identify that. Why is there a naked young man? Maybe he's the same young man that comes, and maybe he's actually an angel as the other Gospels describe. So, One more? Yeah, shoot it. <laughs> When the Pentateuch became physical? So you're talking about the physical text itself. Okay, so here's, here's the thing about the Pentateuch. We know that the Pentateuch consists of sources. And here's what I mean by this. I believe Moses authored the Pentateuch. I believe Moses used, it, used pre-existing material. In the same way that any book you read is going to quote other people, Moses quoted other people. How do we know that? How can we definitively say that is for sure true? Because in Genesis chapter 5, it literally says, this is the scroll of the generations of Adam. 
Sometimes translations obscure that, but that's literally what it says. This is the scroll of the generations of Adam, which means that Moses, as he was writing the Pentateuch, probably had sources in front of him where he said, I'm going to look at the scroll of the generations of Adam. Write it down into one document. I'm going to look at, say, the story of Joseph, that maybe Joseph himself wrote the story. I'm going to include that, maybe copy and paste it. What, we don't know exactly, but when it comes to the Pentateuch, what's interesting is, obviously the Pentateuch is written well after almost all of the events that it describes. I mean, Moses' death is in the Pentateuch. Talk about a problem of authorship. That's a totally different issue. But it's like the Pentateuch is looking at all of this as ancient history by this point. And yet, as you read Genesis, it doesn't feel like ancient history. It feels fresh. Why? Because maybe it was. Like maybe it was pre-written and Moses uses pre-existing material and compiles it in what we have as the Pentateuch. Was, what's, when was the Pentateuch uh, physically compiled? Uh, good question, we don't know, but David had it because he talks about the law, right? Um, before David, they had it because, so I, I, the best answer to that question is at the death of Moses, and I think Joshua finished it. Why? Because I think Joshua was possibly Moses' secretary anyway. So you have, you have Moses who's writing the Pentateuch likely compiling it in pre-existing materials of, of pre-existing materials, which at that point, you then have the tabernacle, which is an established place of worship where the scroll itself was likely deposited, preserved, and kept for future generations. No, so Toledot, uh, so these are the generations of. The book of Genesis is divided uh, by subdivisions known, the Hebrew word is Toledot, which just basically means the generations of. So yes, Genesis chapter 5 is 1. There's 12 or 13, uh, 13 depending on how you count. But Genesis 2, 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. Genesis 5, 1, these are the gen this is the scroll of the generations of Adam. Genesis 6, 8, I believe, these are the generations of Noah. By the time you get to this flood story, these are the generations of Noah's sons. Then eventually you get to the generations of Terah, then you skip Abraham, you get to the generations of Isaac, then Jacob, then Jacob's sons. So the book of Genesis is very clearly, by the way, this is in my book, right? This is actually in chapter 2 that I told you to skip, but if you don't want to skip it, you can read it and you can find out about it. Uh, these are the generations of is the way that Genesis is, is put together, which this is, I'm over time, but I got to say this, which is why it's impossible to read Genesis 1 through 11 as a different genre than Genesis 12 through 50. You say, well, who cares? Here's why that matters. Because what a lot of people want to do is say, Genesis 1 through 11 is mythopoetic, it's proto-history, whatever fancy scholarly terms they want to use. They basically say, Genesis 1 through 11, it's kind of like the parable of the prodigal son or the good Samaritan. It's cool, it's good, maybe there's some historical truth, but you can kind of just throw it away. Well, here's the problem. It's structured in the exact same way as Genesis 12 through 50 with these Toledo formulas. And it literally says in Genesis 5.1, this is the scroll of the generations of Adam. So uh, unless proven guilty, I'm going to take it as, as real history. Does that create some problems? Sure it does. In terms of, okay, well, what do we believe? Do we really believe these people were that old? I guess so. That's what it says. Um, so anyway, that's, yeah, that's what the Toledo formula. So, all right, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Uh, this really is a joy. It's so much fun. I don't know what we're going to be doing when we come back, um, but whatever you want to do, let me know. And, uh, and again, the Bible, like, you can literally spend your whole life studying studying the Bible and just barely scratch the surface. But if we remember that it points us forward to Jesus, we're always going to be on the right track. All right. I love you guys. I'm so thankful. And uh, you're blessed. Have a good night. Yeah.